And I will tell you a little bit about how to find counterexamples to various mathematical conjectures by using some machine learning or some reinforcement learning methods. And the main idea of the talk will be the following. We have these companies, such as DeepMind, for example, that you've already heard about, that have created programs that can play chess, Go, and Atari games at superhuman levels. What's RL? Uh, RL is reinforcement learning. Thank you. Yeah, so that's what we're going to be talking about here. So the real interesting thing about all these programs that they've developed is that they started from knowing essentially nothing about the games, only the rules, and they figured out everything else just by playing the games many, many times, just by themselves. So given the success of these self-learning algorithms or these reinforcement learning algorithms, how nice would it be if we could find a way to use them in mathematics as well? And you could imagine that instead of inputting the rules of chess, you could try to find a way to input some kind of mathematical program to it and tell the reinforcement learning algorithm to get good at solving that problem. And just so I can give an example that's completely different from the ones that Jordi mentioned yesterday, let's try to imagine to input the rules of the game where the goal of the player is to construct a graph with as many as possible, but without any cycles of length four in this case. So you can kind of imagine how something like this could be phrased as a game. You have a player, and you start offering each edge of an n vertex complete graph to the player one by one. For each edge, the player can decide, do I want this edge in my final construction, or do I want to reject this edge? We offer each edge, the player makes a decision for each of them, and once a decision has been made for each edge, the player ends up with some kind of final construction, and the game ends. Now, at this point, we have to give some kind of feedback to the player, reflecting how well they did, some kind of score that is a function of their final construction. So in this particular case, the score could be something like you get one point for each edge that you've included, and you get, let's say, a 100-point penalty for each four cycle that you've created in the final construction. So that's the main idea. We took a mathematical problem. We encoded it in as a game. Now we throw the reinforcement learning algorithm at it. We go away for a few days on a holiday. And when we come back, if everything went well, then hopefully we'll have a program that's very good at constructing graphs with many edges and few four cycles. Now, the reason this approach would be good is that if this works, then this would be a very, very general approach. So there is no reason why a priori we couldn't just pick any mathematical conjecture that could potentially have a finite counterexample try to encode it as a game, throw reinforcement learning at it, and hope that the algorithm will get good at the game of finding a counterexample to the conjecture. So that's what we are going to be trying here today. We will see how well this works in practice and whether we can actually do something interesting with this method. Before I begin, just one quick disclaimer, which is I'm a mathematician, and I'm by absolutely no means an expert in machine learning. So please take everything I'm going to say with a big grain of salt here. Right, so I know many of you know a lot about reinforcement learning, but let me just give you a very brief overview of what reinforcement learning is in a nutshell. So in reinforcement learning, we have a game, and we want to get good at this game. So initially, we'll always assume that we know absolutely nothing about the game at all. So we start by first just playing the game randomly, because we have no idea how our decisions will affect the final score. After we play a game, we get some kind of feedback, and we want to learn from this feedback, this kind of experience that we gathered from playing the game. The kind of experience we always gather is, if in these and these positions I made these decisions, then this is how much score I got at the very end. The way we learn about this is that after we have seen these experiences, we are going to adjust our play style a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, so that in the next playthrough, we are going to hopefully play a little bit better a little bit more reflecting these experiences that, that we have gathered. Then we will be playing this game many, many times. And if everything goes well, then eventually we'll get better and better at the game. So that's reinforcement learning in one minute. We'll be talking more about how this actually works in practice later in the talk. Now, let's get back to what our actual plan is in this talk here. We already said that our goal is going to be to refuting some conjectures. But this is very, very vague, very wishy-washy. So let's try to be more precise 
about what we actually hope to achieve here. First of all, I'm going to try to do everything uh, without telling the program any kind of human insights at all. So I want to see how much these algorithms can figure out by themselves, just by learning by themselves, without any human help. Now, of course, this is absolutely not a practical decision. So if, in practice, you have a conjecture that you thought a lot about and you want to disprove it, then you probably know a lot about the potential structures of uh, the structure of some potential counterexamples. And the very first thing you should always do if you try to use computer searches, you should always hard code this knowledge somehow into your computer searches. For example, if you know that any potential counterexample must have second eigenvalue at least seven, then you want to encode this. It will reduce the search space massively, and it will help a lot to the learning program. We are not going to do that. We are going to do everything, avoiding in inputting any human insights as much as we can. Now, once we have accepted this first axiom here, it will have some consequences. For example, we won't be able to change the architectures of the neural network between different conjectures. We'll be forced to create a very general setup, just some baseline learning algorithm that we can throw at many, many conjectures without changing much at all. That's because if you're allowed to change the architectures of neural networks, that, that could be a way of cheating around the first point because you could be giving, inputting some hints about what potential counterexamples could, be looking, could look like. So we want to avoid that. What we are hoping to do is create one black box learning program, some baseline algorithm that we can throw at 100 conjectures without much thought at all. So that's going to be our plan in this talk here. And these are computer generated conjectures? Uh, the first example will be, but most of them won't be. Uh -huh. Yes. Are they all from the same subfield? Or? Well, I'm a graph theorist, so most of the conjectures I know will be from graph theory or combinatorics. Uh, I did try some other conjectures as well, but there won't be any such things in this talk. Right, so let me just show you one example of how this looks like in practice when you try to use this method. And the first exam ex example I show you is actually a computer-generated conjecture, but I want to use it just as a baby example just to illustrate what this method looks like in practice. So here we have a conjecture. Uh, it's not an open conjecture. There's a counterexample to it. Um, and this conjecture says something about if we have a graph, then its largest eigenvalue plus its matching number is always at least some function of its number of vertices. Now, I would like to ask all of you to try to forget everything you know about graphs. Let's forget what eigenvalues and matching numbers are, and let's completely ignore what the potential motivation for this conjecture could be. And let's focus only on how we would go about attacking this conjecture using only reinforcement learning if we knew nothing about <laughs> mathematics at all. Well, if you want to use reinforcement learning, at least you need to specify two things. You need to decide how are you going to phrase this conjecture as a game, and what should the score function of this game be? Well, we have to phrase generating a graph as a game. There are many, many ways to do it. The simplest possible thing to do is what we did on the very first slide. We offer each edge one by one. The player has to make a decision for each edge, and the game ends after n times n minus 1 over 2 turns. So that's one easy way to formulate this as a game. And what should the score function be? Well, the score function reflect how close the final graph that we generated is to being a counterexample to the conjecture. So in this case, we want to minimize lambda 1 plus mu, so the score function can simply be lambda 1 plus mu. In this case, we want to minimize the score rather than maximize, but it's the same as maximizing minus lambda minus mu. And that's really all we have to specify for a basic learning algorithm to work. And now we just plug it into the reinforcement learning algorithm for, let's say, n equals 19. We go on a holiday, and when we come back, this is something that we expect to see. So here in this graph, the blue line represents the best score that the program is able to achieve as time progresses. You can see in the beginning, it has absolutely no idea what it's doing. It's just generating random graphs with very bad score. That eventually the score decreases, it gets stuck at around 10, but then eventually this blue line drops below the orange dotted line after enough time has passed. How quickly can you compute lambda 1 of mu? <coughs> Those are pre-computed. 
Or no. no. No, you're computing them on the fly. So yes. How could you do that? Well, both of them have very quick polynomial time algorithms. Okay, so that wasn't an issue at all? Yeah, absolutely not. Uh -huh. Yes. So, this is already just for the conjecture for 19 vertices, so beating the, the previous record. So yes. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Um, yeah, so here the, here the orange dotted line just represents the right hand side of this inequality. So the fact that blue dropped below orange simply means that at this point, we have found a counterexample to the conjecture. And then we can look at what this actual counterexample is. In this case, it's a simple graph like <laughs> this that happens to be a counterexample to the conjecture. You send this to the person who made the 600 node counterexample. <laughs> 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 yes. Did you publish a paper with a single picture? We <laughs> love uh, so you had n equals 19, you had 4,500 iterations, so do you offer edges repeatedly? It's not 4,500, it's 19 times 18 divided by 2, which should be like yeah, 200. Your graph showed 4,500 iterations. Oh, 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 yes, yes, sorry, what's it? So you're offering edges repeatedly? Yes. Okay, right, thank you. Um, Oh, Sorry. Uh, oh, Each of those iterations is a is a massive sample. Like, right, right, right. Each iteration right. is a game, right? Each iteration is about a thousand games. So in each iteration, I generate a thousand, a thousand graphs. There are five thousand iterations. I don't know how many graphs there were actually in each iteration. Maybe hundred, maybe thousand. I don't remember exactly. Yes. So I'm asking more real question. Is and my last one. Uh, is is it learning? Is it, is it sort of optimizing separately what to do at each state? Or does it have some policy that has many fewer parameters and it's like learning that, that, that tells you, given a state, what to do? And it's a, That's a very good question. So the question is whether it's kind of brute force figuring out what it should be doing in each different step or whether it tries to learn some kind of general strategy. And uh, there's a lot of states, right? I mean, there are a lot of I feel like there should be too many states for a brute force solution to be practical, so it's probably learning something. What exactly it's learning, I have no clue. <laughs> Where did n equals 19 come from? Is that the smallest? Uh, just, uh, you just pulled it out of The smallest error. example I could find is, so this actually works with 18 as well. I don't think there's a counterexample for 17. I think 18 is the smallest but one. You should play the game for small n. And, and exactly. Then just just try, cool. try different values of n. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure the conjecture is true up to n equals 17. Yes? Um, can, can you say a little bit about like, the actual RL algorithm you use? Actual what? Uh, reinforcement learning uh, algorithm you use. Yes, I will talk okay. about that. I, I will talk a lot about uh, actual algorithm, yes. All right, so once you have this picture, another thing you can do is you can look at what was actually happening through this learning process, so you can look at how the best constructions have evolved over time. You can see in the top left, in the beginning, it has no idea what it's doing. It's just generating random graphs. Then it very quickly learns that sparse graphs are the way to go. And eventually, this kind of balanced double star structure emerges over time. All right. So this was an example where we had a conjecture. Yes? Is there something that keeps the graph connected? Um... Ah, right. So I think for the conjecture, maybe the graph actually had to be connected. I'm not sure exactly. So if that was the case, uh, then I probably gave a penalty if the graph was disconnected. Right. OK, so this was an example where we had a conjecture. There was an obvious way to phrase it to the game. There was an obvious choice of reward function. We plugged it in, and it worked, and we were very happy. So I can tell you from experience that in the overwhelming majority of the cases, this approach I just described doesn't work at all. <laughs> So this here was really a dream scenario. Everything worked perfectly. This almost never happens. So what I want to do in this talk here is present to you five more examples that each illustrate something different that could happen in practice when you try to apply this method, either a different kind of application or different thing that could go wrong, and occasionally how we can overcome these issues in practice. All right. So. There's a reason why I picked that first example to be what it was. It's because of this example that I want to show you. So here's an actual open conjecture from literature. 
that's extremely similar to the first example we've seen. Once again, it's a conjecture that says that for every graph, we have these two parameters, and the sum of these two parameters is always at least something. It's positive here. So once again, let's try to completely ignore where this conjecture comes from, what proximity and what distance eigenvalues are. Let's focus only on how we would attack this using reinforcement learning if we knew nothing about mathematics at all. Well, we need to formulate this as a game, and we need to specify a score function. Both things we can do in exactly the same way as before, except previously we had the score function lambda 1 plus mu. Here, the only thing we need to do is replace lambda 1 plus mu with pi plus delta. We pick a random value of n, let's say n equals 30, we plug it in, we start a learning process, go on a holiday again, and then we come back. So you need to penalize for being disconnected, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, correct. Thank you very much. So the reward actually should be pi plus delta minus a penalty in case the graph is disconnected, minus a thousand points if it's disconnected. That's correct. And if you run it for, let's say, n equals 30, what you might come back to is something like this. So, this is the best construction that the algorithm was able to find after a couple of days of learning. The value of pi plus delta in this graph is something like 0 0.4, but if you look back at the conjecture, the conjecture was that it's always positive. So the fact that here the value is 0 0.4 simply means that this is not a counterexample to the conjecture. So this is an example where reinforcement learning has failed to disprove the conjecture by itself. How does this 0.4 compare to sort of, uh, like, like if, if a human tried some, some simple examples to minimize this, like, uh, What's the smallest number they could get? Uh, <laughs> That's a very good question, and I don't have a good answer to that. I haven't tried by hand ever. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, we have no idea if 0.4 is big. <laughs> it seemed pretty small from the other values I could see, okay. but I don't have any intuition about this conjecture at all. Did the people who formulated the conjecture motivate her with some evidence or some heuristics? Yes. Okay. So, but, yes. Not, but not with evidence where they said this class of graphs, it has this lower bound or something like that. Uh, there was some motivation for this conjecture, which I don't fully remember anymore what it was. But there was a reason where this 2 over 2d over d3 came from. So the interesting thing here is that RL didn't manage to disprove this conjecture. So this approach failed. But many times, that's actually totally fine, because it still gives us a lot of insight about what potential counterexamples could look like. So if you take this picture here, you put it on a tray, and you take it to any undergraduate mathematician, it will be completely obvious to them what kind of structures they should be trying if they want to find a counterexample to this conjecture. Right? You just take this flower, you just increase the number of petals, you make these two paths a bit longer or shorter, and it turns out that if you start playing around with these things, there's no way that you will not eventually find a counterexample to this conjecture, because already something like this happens to be uh, a counterexample. So this was an example where reinforcement learning by itself is not able to find a counterexample, but it gives us a lot of insight that makes actual finding such a thing very easy. How long does n equals 200 take? Oh, it's tell it, I would look for counterexamples with 200. Uh, with this approach, it wouldn't work. It would take forever. Very long holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this approach doesn't scale very well at all. So above 50, it's just not practical. Um, right. So this was the second example. Let me show you another example. The point of this one is to illustrate that this approach has nothing to do with graphs at all. Any problem that can be phrased as a finite sequence of finite decisions can be attacked in the exact same way. So here's a question by Brad and So, who asked, how large can the permanent of a binary matrix be, so each entry is 0 or 1, if we assume that it doesn't contain a pattern of 3, 1, 2? So here I illustrate this pattern where the dark squares are the 1s and the white squares are the zeros. So the kind of pattern that we are not allowed to have is we are not allowed to have 3, 1s in this kind of configuration. And the question is, how large can the permanent of such matrices be? Well, Brad and so had a guess. They said 
maybe the best thing to do is do the simplest possible thing. You take the three main diagonals and the leftmost column. You can check that this doesn't contain a pattern of 312s. And you can trust me that the permanent of this matrix is some kind of Fibonacci number minus 1. All right, so how should we attack this question using reinforcement learning? Well, again, we need to do two things, game and score function. Phrasing it as a game can be done in exactly the same way as we did before, right? Instead of asking about edges, we can just iterate over the entries of the matrix. For each entry, we ask the question, do we want to put a 0 there or a 1 there? And so each game lasts n squared steps, and then we end up with some kind of final matrix. Am I wrong? You can phrase this as a question of directed graphs, right? Just because it's, it's an instant matrix. It's still an instance matrix. It's not Absolutely. symmetric, so you're just repeating a direction from one to another. You need to add loops, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, yeah, still yeah. yeah, that's also a way to do it. The better question is now, what should the score function be? So remember, the conjecture is to maximize the permanent and avoid 3, 1, 2s. Um, so the score function be, should be something like the permanent of the matrix, but you also want to somehow keep in mind that you don't want to have these forbidden patterns. There are a couple ways to do this. It's not obvious what the best choice of reward function is. One natural choice to me would be to have the score function to be the permanent minus some kind of penalty function for each of these forbidden copies of 312s that the final construction contains. So here you have to be careful that the penalty should be big enough, because if your penalty is too small, then your program might figure out that it's beneficial to include of some of these forbidden copies because the gain you get in the permanent outweighs the loss that you get in the penalty function. But as long as you don't do that and your penalty function is really big enough, this approach does work and you do end up with some kind of constructions. It turns out that the previous guess was not quite right. The real best constructions have some kind of much more complicated pattern as illustrated here. So these are the best constructions I was able to find. You mean with reinforcement learning or just with brute force? Uh, reinforcement learning. Um, and the interesting thing to me here was, if you look at the initial pattern of these values, you have these powers of twos that break down at n equals 8. And I was absolutely confident that this 120 value is just because I didn't find the best construction. But then when we go back and I did some kind of heavily computer-assisted case analysis with brute force search and everything, and eventually I managed to, managed to make a proof work that 120 is actually the correct value for n equals 8. So this pattern really does break down at n equals 8 for some absolutely bizarre reasons. I thought it was supposed to be Fibonacci numbers. Did I misremember? Sorry? Wasn't it supposed to be Fibonacci numbers? Yeah. Powers of 2? Yeah. yeah. So this conjecture was already wrong for like n equals 5 or... Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, to, to Kevin's original question, isn't permanent famously hard to compute? Like, that, I thought that is expensive, right? That is very expensive, yeah. So that's why I, there's no chance of this method working up to like 15 or 20. It just gets very, very slow, very, very quickly. So can I ask a general question? Because again, in Jordy's talk, you talked about how representation like, mm -hmm. matters a lot. So I mean, you set this problem up as a game, but presumably there's lots of different ways you could set the problem up as a game. Did you find that if you set the same problem up different ways, there was like drastically different performances? So in general, that's absolutely the case. And Jordi gave some super nice examples yesterday. I purposefully tried to avoid it in these examples because I wanted just take the most obvious representation and try to avoid any human things at all. But it would be very interesting to try it. But although I don't know what would be a good representation here, so I'm not sure what would be a good way to do it in this case. I assume you've entered this into the OEIS. <laughs> then, yeah, I checked it wasn't there, but now it's there because someone entered it. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my other question is, since these pictures do all kind of look the same, can you get like a better lower, I mean, could you sort of figure out how to make a better lower bound from these? Yeah, so there's a product argument. That, so 26, you can get lower bound for the best instruction for 26 by just putting two of these diagonal next to each other. Uh, but so I, I did get an improved lower bound just by this kind of arguments, but it's not the best possible I can do. I don't know what the limiting construction is here. I have no idea. All right. So, so far we've seen three examples where it was always obvious 
how we would go about formulating a conjecture as a gain. This is not always the case. So let me show you some examples where this is not true. So here's a conjecture. Let's not worry too much about what the conjecture is. It says that if we have a tree, we can associate it to two polynomials, and the largest coefficients of these two polynomials occur at roughly the same space, place. So again, let's focus on how we would attack this using reinforcement learning. You could say, let's do the same thing as before. We generate a graph, and then we give a score function representing how close this graph is to being a counterexample to the conjecture. If you did that, then your reward function would consist of two parts. F1 will measure how close this graph is to being a tree, and F2 will measure how close it is to actually being a counterexample, namely how far apart are these two coefficients from each other. So this is definitely something you can do. This should work in theory. In practice, however, in my experience, if you can find a way to rephrase it as a different game, so that you can get rid of one of these two components, that will help learning massively. Now, it's a little bit cheating now with this no human knowledge kind of approach, but I'm OK with this. So let's think about how we could formulate a, graph, formulate a game a bit differently to get rid of one of these two terms. Well, F2 we can get, not get rid of. That's the conjecture itself. But F1 we can. If we can avoid teaching the network how to generate a tree, but rather generate trees directly, that will help a lot. So in order to do that, we need to have some kind of bijection between these trees and finite sequences of finite decisions. There are a couple ways to do that. One of them would be the so-called prefer code, which is just a bijection between trees, words of length n minus 2 from an alphabet of size n. So instead of generating graphs bit by bit or edge by edge, we can generate the prefer code uh, by letter by letter. And if we do that, learning becomes much better. And when we run it for some large value of n, we find some very good constructions with high scores. Now, this here is not actually a counterexample, because if you look at the conjecture, it says this word asymptotically, which means as s goes, n goes to infinity. So any counterexample to this conjecture has to, has to be an infinite sequence of graphs. So here, what we can do is we pick a large value of n, generate the best graph we can do, and then stare at it, turn on our mathematical brain again, stare at it, and figure out why this graph is so good. And once you see this graph and you know a little bit about these two polynomials, it's actually very, very easy to figure out what pattern about this graph makes it so good and how to generalize it. And if you can do that, it's not hard, then you have an infinite sequence and you have disproved the conjecture. So later we'll, show, we'll see another infinite kind of asymptotic conjecture where this approach will not work. Now, this, one is, this was an example here where we had a reward function with multiple components, and we could get rid of one of these components, and it helped things a lot. Sometimes when the conjecture is a bit more complicated, this is not so easy to do anymore. So let me show you just one example of that. Um, one example of such a conjecture where we'll have multiple com components of the reward function, and there won't be an easy way to get rid of one of these two components. Because this necessarily means that the conjecture has to be a bit more complicated, please bear with me for a slide where I give you some definitions. Don't worry too much about the definitions itself. Just try to focus on the melody of what's happening. So what we're going to do is we'll take a graph. We can associate a bunch of different matrices to it. For example, the adjacency matrix. Or we could associate the distance Laplacian, where the ij entry is minus the distance between vertex i and vertex j. And the diagonal entries are so that each row sum is equal to 0. You could look at this matrix, and you can calculate its eigenvalues. And you can ask yourself the question, if two graphs have the same eigenvalues, what other properties must they share? So there's a lot of research done on this. We know that if two graphs have the same eigenvalues, they don't need to have the same number of edges. They don't need to have the same diameter. They do need to have the same Wiener index. They do need to have the same number of connected components in the complement, and so on. One question that wasn't answered in these papers is whether this particular property of being transmission regular is preserved under being co-spectral. So if we want to show that the answer to this question is no, then our task is going to be to generate two graphs. One of them has this property of being transmission regular, the other one doesn't, and they have the same eigenvalues. 
So how can we do that? Well, we can construct two graphs in a naive way. There's a first approach, just edge by edge. The question is now, what should the reward function be? And one way to do it would be to have a reward function consisting of three components now. First of all, we have to make sure that they have the same uh, spectrum, same eigenvalues. So F1 would measure how close these two spectra are to each other. We need to make sure that the G graph has this transmission regularity property. So F2 has to measure how close we are to that. And we need to make sure that F3 doesn't have this property. So in there needs to be some kind of penalty if H happens to have this very rare property. Now, as I said before, if you have a score function that consists of three very, very different things, we are trying to teach three different things at the same time. To me, that usually means that in practice, this reinforcement learning approach is not going to work very well. Ideally, we would love to get rid of one of these three components. But in this case, there's no obvious way to how to do that. It's not obvious how we can directly generate two graphs with the same spectrum, how we can directly generate transmission regular graphs or non-transmission regular graphs. So it seems like unless we do something very clever here, we are stuck with this kind of complicated score function. If this happens, the reinforcement learning algorithm, in my opinion, is just not a very good choice. Uh, to go with, and the only thing you can do is hope that there's a small enough counterexample, which in this case happens to be the case. But if the smallest counterexample had been just a little bit larger, this method would definitely not have found it. <laughs> so it turns out that such graphs exist, and this property is not preserved, and they're being co-spectral. So your score function was just the sum of the three? That's correct. You just got lucky, huh? I got very lucky, yeah. Uh, as I said, if the counterexamples had been just a little bit larger, I don't think I would have found it with this method, and other methods are probably much better for these types of problems. All right, so just one more example that I mentioned before. Wait, has it ever happened that an open conjecture on graph theory was correct? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> let's look at just one more example. And this is going to be, again, about an asymptotic conjecture. So many times, the most interesting conjectures about, are about what happens asymptotically when n goes to infinity. And of course, these are much more difficult to attack using this method in general. So let's have a look at such a conjecture where the previous thing we did will not work. So this is a conjecture of Erdős from 1962. We said, take a graph, count the number of four tuples of vertices that are all connected to each other, count the number of four tuples of vertices so that no two of them are connected to each other, add up these two numbers. He said, this function is asymptotically minimized by random graphs. So this conjecture was open for 27 years, and Thomason eventually found an absolute beautiful uh, disproof to this conjecture. He gave a very, very illuminating reason why this conjecture cannot possibly be true, with some nice several counterexamples in his paper. So we started working on this problem with uh, Gwen Jure, who is a really clever computer science professor from Belgium, and we tried to make it, try to find a counterexample to this using reinforcement learning. Well, how can you do that? In general, for such asymptotic conjectures, in my opinion, we have two uh, paths that you can take. You can, first of all, take a large value of n, find the best construction for this large value of n, stare at it, and hope that you can spot some kind of pattern or get some kind of insight from this best, conjecture, the best construction. So this is what we did in example four. It worked very well here, uh, there. Unfortunately, what happens is when you start working on such conjectures, often the best constructions are, are some kind of algebraic constructions, and these are really, really hard for me to look at and spot some kind of patterns and try to generalize them to an infinite sequence of graphs. So we tried that here. We generated the best constructions we could for n equals 50 or 60, and then we had absolutely no idea how to generalize them. Excuse me, can I ask what's yeah. actually for a counterexample here? A sequence of graphs such that somewhat? That, such that the limit of this function there is lower than the limit for... Uh, for random graphs? Yes. 
Right. So you do have a second method that sometimes works, yes. Maybe I'm, I'm anticipating, but like, shouldn't these two somehow be the same activity? Like, when you stare at something finite and you think about how to extend it to an infinite thing, isn't there some meta step, maybe tacit, where you're, you're making some finitistic construction or repeating, and if you could make that explicit, you would have reduced it to a finite conjecture? So are you saying that's... Like, is there some way that you could, with a little extra work, structure the problem so that a computer could do the, the first generalized by hand thing? Given that they're like, there's some, it's like pattern fitting this finite information that you're sort of using with some additional structure. But that's like, that can go very wrong, right? Because like, if you think about the Dirichlet prime number theorem and the distribution of numbers that are like one mod four and three mod four, and you plug it in into a computer and compute like the first million or something, then it actually looks like there's way more primes, one mod four and three mod four, but eventually in the limit, like they look equal. And that was proved by Littlewood in the 1930s. So I don't know, like, it, it could look weird on a human scale, but in an infinite scale, it could be true. Mm -hmm. The bigger problem is generalization is not unique. Um, uh, so a, a, a given finite count example could have many features which could potentially ex uh, extend to an infinite uh, family, but a human needs to decide which family to pick to, to, to have the best chance of actually making it work. We had uh, one method for doing that called genetic neural networks where you had a recursion equation for the connection matrix on two of the n elements going to two of the n plus one elements, or doubling. But uh, you had to have several families, like a red, green, and blue matrices doing that, that are sort of interweaved by a linear recursion relation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel that that could handle the, the examples you've shown so far, if I can have that in my head. Seems like, and uh, it uh, discovered for a continuous coding problem, it just rediscovered the Walsh functions. So I think it, it, that might, and it, the formula is a bit like the formula for tensor uh, train uh, neural network uh, more recently. So gen mm. genetic neural networks might be able to do this. Okay, that's super interesting. Yeah, to have such method that would work in practice would be very useful for sure. All right. Uh, so what is the second method? Well, sometimes you don't need to do this kind of pattern, uh, figuring out the pattern and generalizing it. Sometimes you can do some kind of cheap tricks to find a way to reduce this infinite conjecture to a finite conjecture. This doesn't always work. In graph theory, you do have a couple of such very cheap tricks. For example, the blowing up argument, where instead of constructing an infinite sequence of graphs, you decide that you will only construct a finite graph take a direct product of it with the complete graph on M vertices and let M go to infinity. And then you're hoping that there will be a counterexample of such shape, which doesn't necessarily need to be the case. If you do that, then what you can do is calculate this limit here, which will not depend on M, of course. It only depends on properties of G. And even more importantly, it's very easy to calculate using some small subgraph graphs accounts of G. So you can use this limit object as your reward function plug it into your reinforcement learning, and it will find a counterexample. Now, a small disclaimer here is that after we did this, there's a group of in Berlin, including Christopher, who is somewhere here in this audience, who showed that actually you can find such constructions without using machine learning. So it turns out that you don't actually need machine learning to find these constructions. You can do some clever local search methods to do the same thing. But whatever method you use to find these kind of constructions using computer search, to me, there is a good and bad news about these approaches. The good news is that this demonstrates that if Erdős had made this conjecture today, it wouldn't have been open for 27 years. He could have easily disproved it within a matter of days or weeks, which is great. The bad thing to me is that so far, I've only always shown you what the counterexamples look like. But once you start working on such conjectures, well, this is what the <laughs> is. I have absolutely no idea what this graph is. It just happens to be the smallest counterexample we could find. So the problem here is that if you find this construction using computer search, it only gives you one bit of information, namely that the conjecture is false. But it's absolutely obvious to me that there's a huge difference in value between the proof of Thomason gives a good reasoning why this conjecture has to be false 
versus this computer search that just gives you one example. Here, it's just false, and that's it. So that's just a small warning about using these methods. All right. In the remaining 10 minutes, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes and how these reinforcement learning algorithms actually work. Now, when we want to choose a reinforcement learning algorithm, we have to choose between roughly two buckets of algorithms. We have value-based methods that learn to evaluate positions in games and policy-based methods that do not learn to do that. They only learn to look at the position and predict what the best move is in any given position. So our task is going to be to look at these two buckets, look at the algorithms in them, and figure out which algorithm is going to be the best for our purposes. Now, there are two issues with that. First of all, different algorithms are good for different problems. So there won't be such a thing as a best algorithm. And secondly, it's not so much about the choice of algorithms, but I had to figure out the hard way that it's actually much more about the how to implement these algorithms rather than what the actual choice of algorithm is. So what do I mean by that? Well, even if you restrict yourself to the very simple problem of generating graphs, you do have many, many choices that you have to make during implementing these algorithms, such as do you offer the edges one by one in the same fixed order, or do you always offer them in a different order? If you offer them in a random order, maybe that will help the network learn to generalize more. Maybe that will just confuse the network. Maybe you want to offer the edges in batches. This way, each game will be shorter. You get more experiences in, in the same amount of time. But each decision will be more complex. So there's always such a trade-off in all these decisions. And the problem is that if you make the wrong choices here, you will end up with some algorithms that are not very good at learning. So in general, there are a couple things that can prevent a reinforcement learning algorithm from learning. So here are just some general issues with these kinds of algorithms. The first one is the sparse reward problem, which says that we play a game for, that lasts 1,000 moves, and we only get a feedback at the very end of the game, which means that in the first 1,000 moves, we are just moving around blindly, and we have no idea whether we're heading in the right direction or not. This directly ties into the second issue here, which is the credit assignment problem, which says that you play the game for 1,000 moves, you got a very good score. How do you decide which of these moves was responsible for getting a good score? So whatever algorithm you choose, you need to keep two these two issues in mind. Now, after you chose an algorithm, you can still make mistakes by bad reward design, or as Jordi has shown us, some really nice examples of uh, how you design the input can also have a huge effect on the output. So bad reward design could be something like having too much of these components when you can actually reformulate the conjecture as a different games to get rid of some of these components, or you make the mistake, like in the matrix case, where the penalty was not big enough, and you end up solving a different problem from what you hope to do. And the fourth one is explore-exploit balance. You want a program that's good at consistently generating good constructions, but you also want something that keeps trying potentially suboptimal moves, because it can never be certain that it's already found the best construction. So it has always been trying some new moves and exploring some potential new hidden strategies to play the game. These two come at each other's expense, and you have to find a way to balance them. Yes? Just an observation. This sounds like a description of the academic career ladder. Sorry? This sounds like a description of the academic career ladder. <laughs> All of it. Right. So these are some general reasons why these algorithms might not work. In practice, there are also some other reasons that I, as a pure mathematician, completely underestimated. Before I started this project, I thought that I would just throw alpha zero at every conjecture, and it would spit out counterexamples <laughs> nuts, and that's it. And I can probably implement alpha zero in like one day and be happy with it. <laughs> I've never managed to throw alpha zero at a single conjecture. And the problem is that even when you choose less complicated algorithms, this is a picture that you will see many, many times. So here you have some learning going on, but it learns, then it forgets, it learns, forgets, and so on. It's complete chaos. So this means that something obviously went wrong. And the problem is that there can be a million different things that could produce pictures like this. In practice, you will always eventually be able to track down what went wrong. But if you're hoping to 
throw this at 100 conjectures without too much thinking, and you always have to spend two weeks debugging your program, that's just not going to work very well in practice. So when you choose your algorithm, you have to keep this in mind. So in the end, the algorithm I settled for is the cross-centered method, which is one of the simplest learning algorithms there is. It's definitely not the best learning algorithm at all. There are plenty of better ones. But the very good thing about this approach is that it's a very, very stable algorithm. So you will never see pictures like this. And it will always be easy to understand what's going on. So in practice, you will save a lot of time by doing that. So what is this cross interval method? Well, it's a policy-based algorithm. We won't be learning how to evaluate positions. We're only going to learn how to predict what the next best move should be. So how do we generate, for example, a graph with this method? We have a neural network. First, we input an empty graph together with a pointer to the first edge, and it will output a probability distribution on the first edge. For example, it could say, you should take the edge with probability 0.6 and reject the first edge with probability 0.4. Then you sample the first edge according to this probability distribution. Let's say you ended up taking the first edge. Now you have a graph with one edge, and you plug it right back into the neural network. Now, with a pointer pointing to the second edge. Once again, you get a distribution, you sample from it, keep plugging it back in, repeat, repeat, until you end up with a graph uh, where you ask the question for all edges. So how does learning work in this kind of setup? Well, this construction defines a probability distribution over the set of all n vertex graphs. So we can just sample 1,000 points from this distribution. And what we're going to do is very simply calculate the score for all of these graphs and pick the, let's say, top 100 graphs. And now what we're going to do is we'll pretend that in these 100 games that we played that got the highest score, in all the positions that we encountered, we always made the correct choice. So we are going to adjust the weights of the neural network a tiny, tiny bit, so that in the next generation of 1,000 games that we'll be playing soon, we will be a little bit more likely to produce games that resemble these top 100 from the previous generation. So that's what we do. Repeat, repeat many, many thousands and thousands of times, and hope that eventually we converge to good construction. Many times that's not what happens, but sometimes this does work. Um, in terms of implementation details, I'm going to be skipping over this. The only one really important thing on this slide is this very, very last slide, very last line here, which is that instead of just learning from the best 100 graphs in the previous generation, it was very useful to learn from the best 5% of the previous generation and the best 5% that we've seen ever so far. That's probably because in many of these conjectures, it's very rare to find these graphs with good scores. So we don't just want to learn from them once, but rather we want to keep them in the back of our minds until we are confident that we can produce examples that are better than them, and at that point we can forget about these graphs. All right, so what can we improve about this method? So this project that I described here is the nice proof of concept. It sometimes works, it usually doesn't. We disproved some conjectures, but just to clarify, we didn't disprove any major open conjectures in this talk. All of these conjectures were just conjectures that someone wrote down. Maybe this is true, but we can definitely do better than that. So in practice, there are two main improvements that you can do if you have a conjecture that you want to disprove in real life. First of all, you should absolutely abandon this kind of zero knowledge approach. We are not at the stage yet where you can just throw reinforcement learning at an end program and hope for a miracle. Any kind of human knowledge that you can input to the conjecture, to the computer, will be very helpful. And the second thing is, you should take into account what you think the counterexample will look like and choose the parameters, the architecture, and uh, the inputs to the neural networks accordingly. And Jordi has made some really, really beautiful examples that illustrate this point. Um, my time is up, so I'm just going to be finishing here by saying that uh, we've seen a lot of related work already in some of the talks, and I'm sure we will see some more in the next couple of days. To me, it's very clear that there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit in this area, and I'm going to be very excited to see what other applications we'll see in the next few years. <laughs>
So thank you very much. <laughs>